Welcome, everybody. Man, I'm so glad that you're joining us today as we worship together online. Wherever you are in the world, look, I may not be there with you right now in your living room or in your house, but here's the deal. God's with you. We're standing in his love, and our fears don't stand a chance, right, when we're standing in his love as we just sang. And you're where you are to make a difference. You heard the testimony of just how, man, wherever we are when crisis arises, listen, the church is there to, to be the difference maker. When the darkest of nights, the light shines the brightest. And so uh, we're, we're here today to worship, and so I, I'm thankful that you're here. These are indeed crazy days, right? So many people living in fear, so many people uh, living with anxiety and worry and just even sometimes even anger, and, and so there's a lot of worry about, you know, what are we doing, how are we going to do it, what's life supposed to look like? And in a world where really our family life has been um, maybe symbolized best by a minivan over the last several decades, right? And I say a minivan because we're always on the go. I mean, how many of you mamas have felt like a taxi driver? I mean, you're always running kids around. We're almost never at home. We're always on the go. Everybody's scattered in a million different directions. And yet now here we are with a whole new reality, right? Businesses are closing, uh, reducing hours, modifying practices to keep us away from each other, uh, avoiding contacts with crowds and people. Jobs are sending you home, right? Some to home are home to work. Others are just home because there is no work. The government is asking us to stay home, to not go out, to practice social distancing, and in some cases, even in certain cities, to shelter in place. So here you are, you're, now you're at home, and so is your whole family, and that's a problem, right? There's nothing to watch on television. There's nothing to do. There's nowhere for us to go, and some of these people are getting on your last nerve. Can I get an amen out of somebody in your living room right now, right? I mean, that just happens. You love them, but you don't love them that much. And you might have to just, you know, lock down and say, I'm going to endure these days. And you may wind up filling up your hours with so much, as much diversion as you can uh, just to numb your pain, right, or to live out these days. But I want to challenge you today, like, to, right, to, to lean in to your faith. And this is the invitation for us as the people of God right now to lean into your faith, uh, to, to do some things that you've always wanted to do but maybe never have taken the time to do. And I want to encourage you to develop some new spiritual habits and faith practices that can not only carry you through these crazy uh, days, but can bless the rest of your life. So if you have a Bible, I want to ask you today to find the Gospel of John chapter 15. We're resuming with our, our study uh, that's called When All is Said. Um, we're talking about the last uh, days of Jesus, whenever he was about to die, lay down his life, he knew that his disciples were about to enter, enter into what I would call the tunnel of chaos, right, where everything's coming unglued, everything's coming undone, and they don't know what to do. And so Jesus spoke in his final hours these final words to provide them with an anchor for their soul, to provide them for some help and some hope to hold on to whenever everything else was coming undone. Now, we started a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about serving, right? That's where Jesus started. Don't get so caught up in yourself that you think only of you. Think about giving your life away, right? Give yourself away, serve other people. Then he said to love. Just like you've been loved by God, learn to love other people and, and shower people with grace, especially the hurting and the broken. Then we talked about the idea of receiving, receiving the help of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want you to live your life, even right now. He doesn't want you to do that in your own strength. He's inviting you to receive the helper the Holy Spirit, who can strengthen you, guide you, give you what you need to make it through these days. Now, we're coming to John chapter 15 today. We're going to learn a brand new word, and that is the word abide. As much as it's important for you to stay at home right now, listen, more important is for you to stay in Christ, to stay in faith, to learn to abide and remain in him. So let's read uh, in John chapter 15 today. The context is the disciples have left the upper room. The last words of chapter 14 were, let's get up and go. So Jesus and his disciples are now walking toward the garden of Gethsemane where he's going to pray for a little while and then Judas is going to bring the mob who are going to arrest Jesus. But on the way, they're walking past probably a lot of different vineyards. Maybe they're even walking where they can see what was called the golden vine that was on the front of the temple, a symbol of Israel. Whatever it was, whether they could see the temple or just see these vineyards, Jesus begins to have a conversation with them about a vine and, and branches and a vine dresser. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, the scripture says this, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. 
You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, check that out, nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and he dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. My father's glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and so that your joy may be made full. Jesus is having a conversation about vineyards. He's talking to his 11 disciples. The point of these verses is not how to become a Christian. It's very important that you understand that. He's not saying to you, hey, this is how you become a Christian. He says to him, hey, you're already clean. Judas is already gone. So these guys are legit. They're believers. They're Christ followers. They're in, right? They're in. But he is talking to them about how do you survive and thrive practically in the midst of everything that you're about to walk through when it seems like your world is coming undone. And so Jesus gives them three powerful words. Abide in me. Just those three words, but those three words have a lot of power. Three words can have a lot of power in your life. If somebody says, I love you, that's powerful. Please forgive me. Accept this rose. In our culture today, you tested positive, right? No more cancer is a great thing to hear. We are pregnant. Hold my beer. Are you ready? Kiss my foot right? I mean, words that have power and they communicate just three words, but they do communicate to us. Jesus says, abide in me, remain in me, stay in me. This word abide, I don't know if you noticed it, but it's used 10 times in 11 verses. The idea of abiding, staying, remaining is that you and God would stay united, connected together, even in the midst of what's going on. What's important is that you stay connected in your faith walk with Christ. Now, it's a command. He commands you, abide in me. You're going to have to learn to do this, okay? For some of you, this is going to be a new thing. It's not about going to church. It's never really been. Your spiritual life should have never been about just going to church, right, and having a service. We've talked about that. What you're going to learn to do is a practice now of abiding with God, of staying connected with God 24-7, Now, here's the deal. It's a discipline. You're going to have to learn to do this because your tendency, like mine, is to drift. Your tendency is not to drift toward God, but to drift away from him. Your tendency, let's be honest, your tendency is to drift toward worry. The more you're on social media, the more you watch the news, the more you start to think about all the what ifs, your tendency, that that doesn't push you automatically to God. Your natural tendency is to drift away from God, right? Remember what we learned a couple of months back? Worry is acting like God's not real. And so your tendency is to drift toward worry. Your tendency is to drift toward the world and worldly things. It's tempting for you quite naturally just to figure out, hey, what am I going to be watching on Netflix? Who am I going to check out on YouTube? Who, who can I, who, whose TikTok can I watch? And you can sit there and waste hours doing those things, entertaining yourself, maybe even numbing your pain, but it doesn't really help you or solve your problems. The world seeks to conform you to its way and to its mindset. And yet the, that, that's a natural and an easy thing to do. And your drift also is toward religion. Even as, listen, even as uh, Christian people, our natural drift is to drift away from connection to God and to drift toward doing religious things. And so you can find yourself checking spiritual boxes, but not ever really connecting with God. There are a lot of folks who, you're so into that, that listen, if, if we never met church again, if God didn't even exist, it wouldn't make a difference in your practical daily life. Now think about that. Come on, think about it with me just for a second. If God were not even real, and we could never meet as a church again, how much of your life would truly be different? Because if the answer is not much, it's very, very possible that you've just drifted toward what's very popular in our culture, which is to have a religion 
but no real relationship or power in connection with God. I think that's what Jesus was trying to communicate to the disciples. If indeed he was looking at the temple, and certainly even if they're walking through the vineyard, he's trying to say that this picture of Israel, where they thought they as the nation were God's chosen vine, that they were God's chosen people, as long as they were Jewish, as long as they were doing Jewish things, we're all good and God is all good. And Jesus is saying, no way. He came to blow that up and shut that down. He's saying to his disciples, in this moment, I'm the true vine. What you need is not religion and and doing good things and trying to impress God. No, you just need to stay in me. He's calling you right now to a connection with him, to abide in him, to remain constantly aware of, surrender to, and even enjoying your relationship with God. So he says, abide, to abide in him. If you're going to avoid the drift and and really remain in God, I think you're going to have to practice some things and discipline yourself to actually stay connected to God, to abide with him. I've been thinking about what does that look like? What does it look like practically for you? I've asked my family, right? That's part of the deal about being cooped up with your family. Man, my poor family, they're going to hear about my sermons until they're blue in the face. I know, Um, but that's all right. Y'all just pray for them. Okay, but I'm asking them, hey, what do y'all do to stay connected to God? How do you intentionally stay connected to God? Rachel says, you know what? One of the things that helps me a lot, my daughter Rachel says, it's worship. She said, if I get up in the morning and I put on worship music while I'm getting ready to go to work, it's like it just changes my whole day. Maybe that's that's the way that you could feel connected to God. My wife, Christy, says it's nature. I, I, just, I just like being in nature. Now, some of y'all are thinking, me too, I'm going to go play some golf or I'm going to go fishing. And look, that's nothing wrong with that. But we're not just talking about being outside doing stuff. We're talking about intentionally in nature observing. She says the clouds, watching the cloud formations and the power of God and sunsets. That's the way God speaks to her and reminds her to abide. I've got a friend named Chuck who every time he sees a bird, he's just reminded that God takes care of the birds. God's going to take care of of me. It's a way of just abiding, remaining in Christ. My daughter Mackenzie said, I got a tattoo. All right, now before you judge and before you hate, I'm just going to remind you that the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 says, man, you got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, hey, put it on your wrist and bind it as a frontal on your forehead. So don't judge or hate for somebody putting something on their wrist to remind them. I said, Mackenzie, tell me about that. She said, well, when I was a senior in high school, um, I was really facing, you know, decisions. What am I going to do next? And I had options and people had expectations, and she said, I was just worried to death that I was going to make the wrong decision and disappoint God or disappoint people. Not everybody could be happy. Maybe you felt the same way. She said, at the same time, you know, I was doing my Bible study, I was doing my reading, but I, I just witnessed a disconnect between my quiet time, we would call it, and just living every day. And so one day in, in our Bible study, we were studying this idea of abide, and, and she was doing a, a K-author Bible study where you actually had to put a little symbol for abide, and the symbol was just a little housetop. Every time the word abide applies, you just put the little housetop over it. She said, it just spoke to me that if I'm abiding in Christ, it doesn't matter what decision I make. God will be good with it. And, and it doesn't matter who's disappointed. God won't be disappointed in me, and I can remain in him. And so she got a little tattoo on her uh, hand that just reminds her every single day just to abide in him. Now, for you, that may look different. You may read books. You may listen to podcasts, and that's a great idea. For me, it's reading the Bible. The way that, that God keeps me connected, the way I feel most connected to the Lord is by, by having time where I'm sitting, I'm reading, I'm contemplating. If you're reading through the scripture right now, especially in the chronological plan, you read this week in Deuteronomy that every time Israel got a new king, the new king had to hand write. Check this out. Come on, kids, y'all are all schooling at home. What if you had to hand write the first five chapters of the Bible? That's what the new king had to do. Hand write the first five chapters of the Bible, keep it with him all the time and read it so that he would be reminded he's not really the man God is, okay? If God thought the king needed to know the word, you and I need to know the word as well. I heard Mike Bro recently mention a study from the Center for Bible Engagement. He surveyed this, they, they surveyed 40,000 Americans from ages 8 to 80, so you probably fall into that range. He said what they discovered really shocked them. They they were studying and seeing uh, how how much does Bible reading actually help? And this is what they found out. Reading the Bible one time a week, that's in church or, you know, you see a Bible verse or whatever, one time a week, almost no difference in your life in terms of your life, your living, your anxiety, your fear, your strength, almost none. Two times a week, almost none, negligible. You read the Bible three times a week, a blip on the screen, right? Like an EKG, You, you got a pulse. But here's what shocked them, that if 
that if you read the Bible four times a week, not every day, not legalistically, but if you engage God through his word four times a week, every day you're moving toward this, I'm connected to God. Here's what they found. There's this huge jump. Feelings of loneliness drop 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drop 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. And then on the positive side, reading the scripture, sharing your faith, it increases 200%. Serving and, and giving yourself to others, discipling others, living beyond yourself jumps 230%. Just by saying, I'm going to get into God's word and stay connected to him. Now, I asked my son, Reagan, and some of his friends the other day. I said, hey, listen, uh, how much time y'all spend on your phone? And their answer uh, almost across the board uniformly was, well, when we were on our mission trip on spring break, almost none. We didn't have much time. We were doing, going, doing our stuff. So, and we didn't have any cell coverage, which does matter. And so they, they couldn't really stay on their phones very much, so their time was very low. But since they've been back, and now they're just at home. Their time averages anywhere from three to 10 hours a day. I, I thought that was a week, but three to 10 hours a day. And then my, my son says, well, dad, how much are you on the phone? I said, that doesn't matter how much I'm on the phone, right? We looked at my phone. I'm on the phone, uh, uh, on my phone, a little under three hours a day. It's embarrassing how much time I'm spending on the phone. Then I asked him a question because it's about them, not me. I asked him this question. I said, if you, if you really thought about abiding, right? If you really thought about just staying connected to God, how much do you think you could pray or be mindful of God, including reading the Bible, stuff like that? And they all said, listen, all these kids are somewhere between you know, 16 and probably 23 years old. They said, uh, I think I could make it at least an hour. Some said I could make it more. I could make it more. If I really put my mind to it, I could make it more. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. To abide in him, you're going to have to put your mind to it. If you just sit at home and veg out, if you just do what comes natural, your drift is going to be toward worry, the world, and having a religion with zero power in your life. But if you would say, you know what? I got some time. So I'm going to take the time to begin to listen to worship music, to sit in nature and experience God, to to put some things in my heart and maybe even on my body that, that I would just remind me that, God, I'm connected to you. I'm not just staying inside. I'm staying in Christ. That's the power of this idea of abiding. Abide with me. It's the command of God. Look, it's really what I'm, I'm wanting for your life. It's what you really need. Things will change if you begin to abide in Christ. Now, here's the deal. In this scripture, why was Jesus asking them to do that? What happens? What results whenever you start to abide in Christ, when you start to make some changes and say, you know what? I'm going to devote some time to God. Maybe even every day I'm going to put a, an alarm on my phone or throughout the day remind myself that I'm not alone. I'm not disconnected. I'm connected to God. Here's what Jesus says, right? Here are three things that happen in this scripture whenever you start to connect with God every single day. Here's the first thing that happens. Jesus becomes your source. All right, so if you're a note taker, you could write that down. Jesus becomes my source. Jesus gives me the things that I need. Now, I'm getting this from verses 4 and 5, right? John 15, 15, 4 and 5, here's what it says. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, you can't bear fruit. But if you would abide, Jesus said, just like a branch connected to a vine gets everything supplied to it that it needs to ultimately produce the fruit, Jesus says, I'm going to do the same thing for you. If you'll just stay connected to me, fruitfulness will come. I'll supply you nourishment, protection, whatever you need. He's got it. All right. Some of y'all have been wondering what I have these uh, flowers over here for. Maybe if you could see them. I don't know if you could or not, but I brought these flowers with me today. And these are beautiful, right? Come on. Y'all look at them. Y'all see those? Those, those pretty flowers. Um, if you give somebody these flowers, you might, you know, get back in good graces with them if you've messed up. It might get you some favor. You might have a romantic, you know, time if you give some flowers, whatever. These, these flowers are really, really beautiful. But check them out. Here's what I want you to notice about these flowers. As beautiful as they are, all of these flowers are dead. They just don't know it, right? They're dead and they just don't know it. Why would I say that? They look beautiful on the outside. Yeah, but they've been cut off from their 
life source from their supply. They're sitting in water. They're going to try to stay perky as long as they can. But the fact is, it's just a matter of time. They're dying. Now, that's a picture of us without Christ. If you get cut off, severed from him, you may look good for a while, but you really won't produce the things that God wants you to produce. But more than that, you won't receive what God has for you. Come on, who am I talking to? Who am I talking to right now in your living room? You're watching this message and you're thinking, man, I want God to supply me. And the key to that is not coming to church. The key is not even filling your brain with podcasts as much as that might help. The key is for you to establish a vital connection and stay in a vital connection with Jesus. Remain in him. Jesus says in John 15, right, verse 1, he started off and he said, I am the true vine. Again, Israel's mindset was, hey, we're, we, were bo- we were born right, right with God because we were born into the Jewish religion. And Jesus is saying, no, you're not. You're not born a believer. Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I'm the true supplier of everything that you need. Now, this I am saying, I am the true vine. It's the last of seven sayings uh, in, in John's gospel where Jesus is saying, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd, right? He says these things, and he's identifying himself as God among us. It's kind of John's way of writing a beautiful uh, gospel that just says, I want you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's God among us. And so Jesus has these I am sayings. And some of y'all know what I'm about to, where I'm about to go. Others of you, this may be news to you. But here's why that's significant. Because in the Old Testament... When God was revealing himself to a guy named Moses, right? Moses is on the run. He's in in the backside of nowhere. He had uh, killed an Egyptian whenever he was uh, living as a son of Pharaoh in Pharaoh's house. Moses was. He killed a man who was mistreating an Israelite. And whenever that got uncovered, Moses, Moses started running. He was on the lamb. He was living in the backside of nowhere for 40 years. And one day God appeared to him in a burning bush, spoke to him. Moses stopped. God says, hey, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Right? And so God is speaking with Moses, and he says to Moses, I'm sending you back to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And so he and God wrangle about that a little while, and finally Moses starts saying to God, God, if I go tell your people that, that you're setting them free, they're going to ask me, who are you, and what am I supposed to say? Now check these verses out in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to go to the sons of Israel, and I'm going to say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What's his name? And God, what do you want me to tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is God's revelation of who he is. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me. This became the identifier of God. The the covenant name Yahweh just simply means in Hebrew, I am, right? So that's how you know that it's God because he's I am. Now the question is, I am what? I'm what? And God, I think, intentionally left that open-ended because God was saying to Moses and us, to his people, uh, Israel, and to you and me, God is whatever you need. Just think about it. God says to his children, listen, if you need grace, I'm grace. If you need love, I'm love. If you need protection, I'm protection. You need provision, I'm provision. God is whatever you need. You need. That's what Jesus is communicating in this saying, even to his disciples. He's saying, I am your provider. I'm the one who's going to give you whatever you need. And he's saying that to you right now. Okay? You may be, as my calculus teacher in, the, in uh, high school used to say, at home alone in the privacy of your own room. Right? That may be where you are right now. But can I ask you, what do you really need? What do you need? Sitting there with your family on the couch right now, what do you need? If you, if, if you could just say, man, this is what I think I need right now, what is that? Do you need peace? Do you need some kind of assurances that, that things are going to be okay? Do, do you need some type of provision because you're worried sick about how you're going to pay for your food? Do you need some type of protection? You're worried to death that you, you might get sick. Do you need healing? Is that what you need? I have a friend who was uh, talking with some of his friends recently, and he said, you know what? I, what I really need right now is I need a buzz. Maybe that's what you think you need. But can I just remind you that better than a beer buzz, the Bible tells you in Ephesians 5 that you could have a Jesus buzz, that you could be filled with the Holy Spirit, that he could give you a peace and a freedom and a, and, and a rest that you can't get anywhere else. Jesus says, if you'll abide in me, 
I am whatever you need. He's your way maker. He's your miracle worker. He's your promise keeper. He's your light in the darkness. I love that song, don't you? He's that. He's, not, he's that not just when you're singing the song. He is that every day. So abide in him. Remain in him. Stay connected. I love this quote by a guy named Robert Mulholland because I think it captures so much of what our heart is. He says, as Christians, we try to live for God in the world when what we ought to do is live in God for the world. You see the difference? You're not trying to do something for God in the midst of the world. No, you're just gonna live in God for the world. And while you're living in God, while you're living connected to Christ, he's gonna give you everything you need to make it through. We learn from Christ, we live in Christ, and then we share what we know with other people. Jesus becomes your source. All right, here's the second thing that I want you to see is God becomes your gardener. And I'm picking your gardener just because he's talking about vineyards and, and I don't know what a vineyard keeper is outside of vineyard keeper. So we're just gonna call it, he's your gardener. He's the one who's gonna be the one who gives you care and gives you oversight. John 15, one, again, look at it. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He's the one who owns the vineyard. God is the one who's in charge. God's the one who cares for both the vine and the branches. He tends, he waters, he protects, he cultivates all the branches so that they produce maximum fruitfulness. Now, think about it. For the disciples specifically, they really needed to hear this. I believe it was a welcomed word because again, Jesus knows their world is about to be flipped upside down. They don't. But in the midst of the chaos and the, tr and the, and the trouble, Jesus is reminding them, listen, you have somebody who's in charge of you and everything else, and he's got it. He's going to be the one who cares for you and gives you everything you need. And so here these disciples are going to find themselves hunkered down, hiding out in their upper room, right? Not because of faith, because of fear. They're practicing social distancing of their own sort, right? They're, they're, they're staying away, sheltering in place, all out of fear because Jesus, their leader, has been crucified. That's what's about to happen. And yet Jesus is speaking over them. Listen, in the midst of all the crazy I want you to remember that you have a gardener, you have a vine dresser, you have a shepherd who's watching over you right now. And I, I speak that over you. I speak that over you, whether you're in some rural part of Mississippi or whether you're in downtown Atlanta or wherever you find yourself in the world. I speak over you that you have a God who loves you and who is in full control, who sees you, knows you, and as your gardener, your keeper, your vine dresser, he is there to take care of you. Of you. What does the gardener do? If you look back in that scripture, it says that here's what the vine dresser does for the branches, right? He picks them up and he cleans them off and he even prunes them. One of the most important things that a vine dresser would do is to take away the things that were dead off of the vine that might cause rot, disease, or decay and keep them from being fruitful and then to bind up those healthy places. It hurt the plant, I'm sure, to be cut and pruned, but it was always leading to something better. Jesus is saying, God is your vine dresser just like that. What God wants to do for you right now, where you are, he wants to pick you up. Listen, God can clean you off. You may have drooped and, man, your life may be, uh, in your opinion, not worth very much because of things that you've done, but yet God as your vine dresser picks you up, he cleans you off. He's gonna prune you a little bit in all likelihood, remove some things maybe from your life that, that don't need to be there. He's going to bind you up so that your life produces all that he has for you. Can we have a real talk? We're all in time out right now. That's what I feel like. I feel like we're all in time out. I feel like God was saying, you guys have drifted so far from what really matters. You're so caught up in all the stuff of the world. You think you all got it under control. You think y'all have it under control. Hey, watch this. And in a moment, I don't think God's causing the pandemic. I don't think God's causing the crisis. But I think in this moment, in this time of time out, God is looking at us as his kids saying, talk to me. Is all the stuff that you were hoping on, counting on, thinking that was, you know, you just couldn't live without. Is that really, does it really matter? Is it really necessary? Is it really going to fulfill you? Even in this moment right now, I'm thinking about two couples that I know who had big, huge weddings planned. And because of the requirements now, they couldn't have a public wedding. So you know what they did? They got married anyway. And you know what? They're just as married. They're just as married. 
as if they had this big shindig and everybody's present. They're just as married. God is saying, so much of what you think you have to have to live, you don't have to have to live. What you need is me. And if you've got me and I've got you, that's going to be enough. Would you choose right now to trust God, to shepherd you, to care for you, to lead you, to protect you, to provide for you, to be your shield, to be your shelter, as long as you're connected to Jesus? That's his promise. There's this scripture in Isaiah 43 that that I love to claim in times like this. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says this, But now thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, don't fear, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name and you're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. When you're walking through the rivers, they're not going to overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you're not going to be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. Would you stay connected to him right now? Because he says, I'm the one who's going to care for you. Here's the the last thing that happens whenever you are connected to God, according to the scripture, is your life begins to bear spiritual fruit. You begin to be changed. You begin to be made different. Your job is to abide. You don't have to do anything but stay connected to God. But as you're connected to God, something begins to happen inside of you. And as a branch abiding in the vine, all you're doing, staying, remaining, abiding, man, God begins to work something in you that begins to work out of you. He says there are several things that that happen in your life. One is your prayers get answered. I get that from verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask me whatever you want to, and it'll be done for you. Answer prayer. How many of you want your prayers answered? I know I do. I'm I'm bumping into people around around town if I'm out buying groceries or whatever, and they're saying, hey, man, we need to be praying. Yes, we do, but more than just praying, I want answers. Come on, I want God coming through. I want to see God work. And so Jesus says, here's one of the ways you can have your prayers answered. Abide. That doesn't mean that God's going to answer every random selfish prayer you pray. It's a picture of you learning to pray in a new way. Come on, Pine Lake, in in this season of our lives, God may be having us in a timeout so he can teach us to pray. We got time. Come on, all we got is time right now. So learn to pray like he wants you to pray. You abide in him. You let his word begin to resound and abide in you and begin to let it shape the way that you pray your prayers. You're not praying so much about your own conveniences and your own creature comforts and your own self-promotion. You begin to say, God, let your, let your will be done. I can pray about anything, but the way you pray begins to change as you're abiding in God and his word is abiding in you. Seems like forever ago now, but in February, we uh, did our P28 plus one challenge, right? And so you were praying about one thing for one minute at one o'clock. And over the course of those days, I heard so many people say, man, God answered my prayer. Maybe it wasn't like I thought it was going to be, but God answered my prayer. People got jobs and people far from God started coming back to God. And it was so exciting for folks who'd been praying for them. People who needed breakthrough got breakthrough. At one of our gatherings, there was a lady who stood up and she, she had been experiencing chronic pain for a long, long time. And yet there was a moment in that night where we sensed that God was just saying, hey, if you're under it, you feel like God, th- there's something choking you, holding you down or weighing you back, holding you back. Would you just stand up in faith right now? And so this lady just felt like, man, this pain is holding me down. It's holding me back. It's choking the life out of me. And she stood up in faith and some people gathered around her and prayed, asking for God's grace and mercy and power and healing over her life. And she said, God touched me and I have not had any pain in my life since that night. Listen, God hears us whenever we pray. And so I'm asking you, would you, would you with me, could we do something? All right, this is a walk away. Would you with me join in and until we can gather again publicly, I don't know if that's going to be 14 days, 28 days. I don't know how long that's going to be. But until we get to meet again publicly together, would you agree with me to pray for one minute at one o'clock about one thing every day? And that is, God, would you do something in the, in the midst of us? Would you just, you and your family, maybe even praying out loud. You can do it at one, you can do it two, you can do it at seven, it doesn't matter to me. But would you begin to pray, God move. Go back and look at those things that we prayed even last week that God would move in our government leaders, that God would forgive us and give us grace, that God would touch uh, medical personnel, that God would just super, supernaturally intervene, that he would give peace and unity, that he would give us love, that God would let the church be the church. Pray those things. 
God says, if you'll abide in me, my word's abiding in you, ask me, church, and I'll do it. Here's another thing that happens. You begin to experience deep joy. That's what he says in this scripture. We could use a little joy right now. Everything's such bad news that we're getting, we're getting, and yet God wants you to have good news. He wants you to have joy. This is verse 11, John 15, 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Jesus gives us peace, not like the world does, and now he's saying, I want to give you joy like you've never experienced before. Notice that it's full joy. Not sometimes joy, not a little bit of joy, but he wants to give you full joy, but it's his joy. God wants to give you and your household. He wants it to be filled with laughter. He wants it to be filled with peace. He wants it to be filled with with positive thoughts and, and, and energy, we would say. But that comes from his spirit living in you. It's the fruit of the spirit. Here's what the scripture says in Psalm 16, verse 11. Jesus, God, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. Do you see it? That if you're connected to God, his presence is a place of joy. Abide in him and he gives you joy. And then you'll live in love. This is what happens. You begin to live in love. That's verse 9, John 15, 9. Just as the Father's loved me, I've loved, you. I've loved you. So abide in my love. You begin to experience God's love when you abide, when you just stay connected. You hear him say to you every day, you're enough for me. And you experience his love, and then you can give that love. That's verse 12. We didn't read it, but John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. You release love. You give love. You you have love in your heart now from God that you can give away. Your heart begins to be changed, and you abide and remain in him. Now, here's the deal. Everybody is at home right now, and the togetherness is exposing our differences. School and work really are a blessing. Come on. School and work are really a blessing because we separate from each other and then we can come back and maybe tolerate each other for a little bit. If you're going to stay for several more weeks like this, there got to be some love up in here somewhere, right? How's that going to happen? You're not going to will your way into feeling better, but you can abide your way into having love that you don't have on your own. Abide in me, experience the love of God, and then his love begins to be the love that you give. I have a friend whose brother is a lawyer And the lawyer said that this virus is actually good for his business. He said initially it's good because when all these people are, you know, cooped up in the same apartment or house or trailer or whatever for long enough, man, there's going to be some love in the air. And in nine months, there's going to be a lot of babies being born. There's going to be a baby boom in about nine months. I don't know if that's true or not, but probably so. And somebody's going to name their poor kid COVID. I just know it. It's going to happen. Just get ready for it. Okay. But then he said, but in the long run, here's how, here's how this virus is going to be good for my business. He says, over time, these families who are cooped up together, they're going to fight more. They're going to be more domestic issues. This, there's going to be more divorce and more paternity issues. Now, that's a sad thought, but that's a guy giving real talk about his business. Can I just say to you, it doesn't have to be that way at your house that if you would abide in him, no matter if anybody else does in your family or not, if you would abide in him and experience his love and then begin to give that love, hey, look, this time of time out could be one of the sweetest times in your family's life. God gives you love. And then here's the last thing, God, God's glorified. This is part of the fruit that God bears. God is glorified in you. This is verse eight where he said, Jesus said, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Church, the great desire of Jesus's heart was that the father would be glorified. It's why he left heaven. It's why he lived the way he lived. It's why he died the way he died. Not for you and me, that's a, that's a result. He did it because he wanted the fame and the name of God to be exalted over all things. So he lived his life and died his death for the glory of God. And he says to you, you want to be my disciple? You want to be my follower? Start living your life with that same goal and purpose in mind. Not to get yours, not to even help other people, but to let God be glorified in the way that you are living God is glorified, I believe, whenever your greatest desire is to be with him. You want him more than anything else. God, I've tasted and seen that you're good. I want to be connected to you. Nothing satisfies me like you. I think about Psalm 42 where the psalmist wrote, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now that sounds awesome. And yes, I want God. But if you read the whole psalm, the psalmist is saying, 
I'm in despair. I'm running for my life. I'm like a deer on the run. And there's a lot that's closing in on me. But he says, but God, you're my greatest desire. And I would say to you, if God becomes your greatest desire, God is glorified in that. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. When you begin to just abide in him, it's glorifying to God. And here's the second thing that happens is people see and they see you abiding in God and Jesus is supplying you everything and God's giving you grace and favor and covering. And they're wondering, where are you getting all this peace, dude? Where, where's your family coming by this joy? How do you have such love? How do you have such patience right now when everybody else is freaking out? What is the key? And you're going to be able to say, listen, man, I'm just abiding in Jesus and he's given me everything I need. That's what the scripture says in Matthew 5, verse 16, where Jesus says this, let your light shine before men in such a way that they could see your good works and give your Father who is in heaven all the glory for it. Hey, would you let the world see that you're connected to the vine, you're covered by your gardener, and your life is beginning to give evidence that you truly have Christ in you and in your house. Hey, here's the way I want us to end today. I want us to pray. I want us to pray as a family. You can pray out loud together or, man, you can pray in your heart. But let's just, as, as we end our time, hey, let's pray together. So would you pray with me uh, all over um, the, this online service, wherever you are. You can just bow your head with me. Let's close your eyes. I'll guide you, to, guide you to pray. Hey, would you just start your prayer this way? Hey, would you receive Jesus as your source? Would you just pray something like this? God, apart from you, I can't do anything. You're the one who has to give me everything. Give me life. Give me peace. Give me help. Jesus, would you be my source? I receive you as my source. Would you pray this? Would you pray, God, as, as the vine dresser, the gardener, the one who rules all things over my life in this world? God, I just ask you, would you rule over me? God, would you let your, your nearness be my good? Would you ask God to protect you, provide for you? Be your healing, be your strength, be your comfort. Maybe just pray it over your family. Pray it over your house. Would you right now, would you just invite the Spirit to produce the fruit of Christ in you? Would you invite Him to shape your praying and fill your heart with joy, give you love, and let God be glorified in you. Lord God, we just bless you. We praise you, Lord, that in crazy days like this, your word is alive as ever. God, it's timely. It's timely for us that, Lord, we have a lot that's on our heart and our mind. God, there's so much that we need. And yet, God, the, the main thing we need is you. Jesus, we need you just to speak your peace and, God, to be our peace. God, to be our help in this storm. And so, Lord, we declare that you are sovereign, God. You're over all things. That, God, you're even sovereign over uh, a virus that's impacting our world. And yet, God, we plead with you for mercy and for grace. God, we plead with you for your supernatural hand to be at work. God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, Jesus, you would fill us right now with love, joy, peace, patience. God, fill us with kindness and goodness and gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. Lord, would you let your church be the church as we abide in you for your glory. Lord, we pray this in, in Christ's name today.